talk about, and I'll be talking from a number of slides here. Uh, I think of every market as consisting of three parts, and therefore every market experiment ought to have these three parts. There's a uh, there's a an environment, a value cost environment, and it's the, and it's the value cost environment that is primarily emphasized in economic theory. In, in reduced form, in a simple experiments, it's simply the supply and demand schedules that are operating in the market. And I'll give, I'll give you an example here shortly of that. But in addition, in order to do an experiment, people have to know what to do. They have to know what the rules of the game are, what, what, what's, what's the language of the market. Okay, and the institution is concerned with defining in any market uh, what kinds of messages that people can send or announce and also the, the uh, market institution defines the rules that convert these messages into outcomes, all right, final allocation. Uh, take a, a simple English option where an antique painting or a chair or something is put up for sale and, uh, and the rules are that the buyers announce bids. Uh, as soon as uh, there's a first bid on the floor, the rule is that it, it stands until there's a new higher bid. And then the new higher bid displaces the standing bid. That process continues until the auctioneer can't get any more bids. And then the rule is then you stop the process and the item is awarded to uh, that last bidder at, at whatever the bid price was. So, uh, there's a lot of market institutions that have very, uh, have articulated in great detail uh, the rules of that market. If you look at the uh, Constitution Rules of the New York Stock Exchange, it's a thick published book with all these detailed rules as to how that market operates. The Chicago Market Exchange in Chicago has a uh, also the Merck uh, Constitution and rules. But what's interesting about the Chicago Merck is it's a loose leaf notebook. You can take the pages out and put new pages in. Now that's interesting. It tells you something about the dynamics of an institution. Okay. The rules change over time. Uh, and a third thing that's in every market experiment we do, as in any mark, real market out there in the world, is the behavior of the participants. Now, economics tends to be, economic theory tends to be stronger on the first item here than it is on the other two, although that's changed a lot in the last two or three decades, because now we get economic theory modeling much more completely and fully things like uh, um, auctions. We have first price sealed bid auctions, second price sealed bid auctions. We have a model of, the, of Dutch auctions. The Dutch auction is like an English auction, except that the, the price comes down from above rather than from below. Uh, the auctioneer calls out prices, very high prices, and lowers them until he gets someone to accept uh, the item. And notice now the difference between an English and a Dutch auction is huge, because in an English auction, you're getting lots of information in the process as the things go up. In a Dutch auction, everything is very quiet as the price comes down and tells you we have the first person to take it, and then the auction's over. So, <clears throat> institutions are important because the rules are important. The rules are important because they affect incentives. Okay, and that's if there's, if there's a major lesson in the experimental economics, one major lesson. That's uh, uh, certainly uh, one of the, one of those major lessons. Now, I'm going to give you an example of this. Simple supply and demand experiment, and many of you have probably know about these experiments. You've been in classes where you maybe have an instructor that that uh, used uh, uh, ran a double oral auction experiment. You all see that? Can we have these front lights out? I 
think when we try it out, we know where they are. Oh, oh, I'll take that. Ah, that's better. Really dark though. You're really in the dark room, sir. How's that? Oh, I cut, cut it. Cut it. Yeah. Okay. Whoops. There. Okay. Now here's an example of a value cost environment. And if you, I don't know whether you, how well you can read it from where you're sitting, but in this experiment, there's three buyers and three sellers. Uh, buyer number three here has been assigned three values. One value is up here at, uh, it looks like, uh, 350. And then there's a value at 320. And then one down here at 280. Now, if you were in this experiment and you were buyer three, that's the only information you would be given. You know the maximum, you, you know what the, the value of this item is to you uh, if you buy up to three units. You have a capacity to buy up to three units. And also your understanding is that for each unit you buy in the market, I'm going to pay you in cash each period that we trade. <coughs> the difference between the value of the unit and whatever it is you pay in the market. So if the value of your first unit is 350, and you pay, you buy a first unit for three dollars, I owe you 50 cents. And if if you buy a second unit for three dollars, I owe you 20 cents for that unit, and so on. And then. But if we're going to trade over a number of market periods, and you'll be paid in cash or total earnings at the, at the end of the experiment. In a typical experiment, the subjects are recruited. They come in, they're paid $5 for showing up on time, and they're, they're paid whatever it is they earn in, the, in cash at the end of the experiment. Uh, and, and, then, and then we pay them private, uh, their earnings. And the subjects make all the way from a, a few dollars to sometimes uh, $60, $80, in a few cases, we have experiments where people actually earn two or three hundred dollars. Those are usually experiments where they come back uh, in, in a series of, we, we wanted them to get very experienced, and, and these tend to be complex experiments, like trading electric power on a, on a high voltage network, or trading gas in a pipeline network, or something like that. And uh, so, a, a, a subject in one of these experiments can make $150, $200 in, say, three uh, two-hour sessions, three or four two-hour sessions. Um, all right, unknown to buyer number three is that buyer two and buyer one have these values. And if we sort those values from highest to lowest, we have a maximum willingness to pay schedule. It's a maximum willingness to pay because you don't earn anything if you pay exactly what the value is. Okay, you're just you're just uh, flat, and you and the lower the price at which you buy, the more your profit is. Sellers are treated just symmetrically, except they receive costs, and they receive the difference between the prices at which they sell and the costs that they buy the sign. So if we array the seller unit costs marginal cost from lowest to highest, we get a, a minimum willingness to accept uh, schedule or supply schedule. Uh, now, uh, uh, the, we have a kind of a really well-defined way of measuring efficiency in this market because this area here that I've shown across the to the green, that represents the maximum possible gains from exchange in this market. If, uh, suppose that area is $10, and suppose at the end of a round of trading, first period, suppose I, I owe the six subjects $9. Okay, they've captured 90% of the gains from exchange. And, and we call, and that becomes a, a direct measure of the, of the efficiency uh, of that market. All right, now, so that's, that's the environment. Now we could have, there's lots of different institutions we could use. We could have buyers submit bids to buy and sellers submit offers to sell and just cross 
take the bids that are submitted and array them from highest to lowest on price and uh, the offers from lowest to highest on price and just take the cross and, and, and clear the market that way. Uh, we can have sellers post prices like in retail markets and then the buyers queue up and have some device for deciding which buyer comes first because the first buyer out of the queue is going to want to buy from the lowest price uh, seller. Uh, so that would be a, one way to or organize the market. Another way is to organize it as a, what's called a continuous double auction. And the data I'm going to show you is, is uh, using that institution. In a continuous double auction, uh, a, 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 it's like the English auction, in the sense that the buyer announces the bid, except it's two-sided. And now a, a buyer announces a bid to buy, a seller announces an offer to sell. And then the rule is, there's an improvement rule, rule 71 and 72 on the New York Stock Exchange, a new bid has to be higher than the standing bid, a new offer has to be lower than the standing offer. And so there's a tendency for the so-called bid ask spread to narrow under the rules. And at some point when a buyer accepts, either a buyer accepts a standing offer to sell or a seller accepts the standing bid to buy, either way, you get a contract. That's why it's called a double auction, because the contracts can come from, from either side. And once there's a contract, then the market waits, waits for new bids and offers. Okay, so the process is one is bid, bid, offer, 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 contract, and starts over. Okay? Well, here's a market that we ran for uh, five periods. The, the dots here are bids. Here's a bid clear down here. Okay, and, and the circles are offers, and here's an offer up here. So the bids and offers, in some order, gradually narrow. And here's the bid ask spread. Looks like around 260. Five to about 285, something like that. And at that point, some buyer accepted the, the offer. So the, the line there is going through a circle or a dot represents the sequence of contracts. Okay, and then the market, new bids and offers, and we get a second contract, and so on. Now, in this particular market, these subjects were experienced. They've been in a previous double auction, although not in this environment. This is the first time they'd ever been in this particular pattern of, of with seen this particular pattern of values and costs. Now keep in mind that nobody in the experiment sees what I'm showing you. Nobody sees this, this supply and demand. Uh, or might not, the subjects might not understand it if they did see it. Okay, and they have no background, and no, uh, and, but the point is that has, our ability to function in markets has almost nothing to do with how much we understand it. Okay, businessmen don't have to understand a lot about the consequences of their actions in order to sort of know when they're making money and when they're not and try to take and correct and take action, appropriate actions to try to correct the situation. <clears throat> And so here's people with a little bit of experience who, who, who've been in one of these markets before, and here they are trading actually fairly close to the competitive equilibrium, which is the price here of uh, 280, I guess. Here's period two, three, four, five. Um, now, these kinds, and, and what's the efficiency? Well, in this particular case, the 100% every, every period. And that's kind of unusual to get those sort of uh, results the, the first time. The fact that those subjects were experienced probably helped. Here's another uh, example. Uh, I'm particularly fond of this chart because it's the first experiment I did. It was in January 1956. And I had the 11 buyers and 11 sellers. When when I started out, uh, I'd been uh, very much influenced by my education, 
And I had a Harvard education, so naturally I thought you had to have, if competitive markets were going to work, you'd have to have a really large number of buyers and sellers. And I didn't really expect this to work very well because I only had 11 buyers and 11 sellers. Of course, much later, I, what I discovered is if you have two or three on each side of the market, you have enough for, to produce competitive outcomes if you uh, use this oral double auction type of institution or electronic. Uh, this one was done orally. The, the uh, market I showed you here, the subjects were all sitting at a computer terminal, and the bids and offers were being announced on their screen, okay, uh, as they occurred. So, let me, I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time showing you these charts because it gets to be sort of boring. It, there's been hundreds, thousands of these done. And here's one that I did way many decades ago with very asymmetric supply and demand schedules where most of the surplus here, the gains from exchange goes to the sellers and very little of it to the buyers. And in those markets, it tends to converge from the side where the, where the, the uh, surplus is, is greatest, the gains from exchange is greatest. But it still tends to converge fairly quickly into the competitive equilibrium. Most of these will converge in about within three or four periods. Uh, very early on, I wondered if I could find a, a, an environment, a design, that would uh, prevent, that we, I wouldn't see this convergence of competitive equilibrium. So I came up with this very pathological kind of design in which the buyers here, in this market there are seven of them, all have the same value, 420. And then the sellers, I think there's 16 of them in this experiment, all have the same cost, 310. And in those early days, I would often pay a commission just of five cents just for trading. And the idea there was that you had a minimum inducement to trade right at your cost if you got this commission of five cents, uh, or uh, a minimum incentive to trade right at your value if, uh, if you were a buyer. So in this experiment on each, each contract, if it's at the competitive equilibrium, we'll use, we'll yield a five cent commission to the seller and a dollar ten plus the five cent commission, a dollar fifteen cents to the buyer. So almost all of the surplus is going to the, to the uh, buyers in that market. And I thought maybe that would uh, uh, create problems because e even though the buyers and sellers don't know that there's that sort of asymmetry, I thought that might make buyers soft enough in the, in the negotiation process that it might not uh, work. Well, I was wrong, and although it started out, price was pretty high, they tended to converge down to the competitive equilibrium. That's one group, and then here's another group. Again, started out high, and then collapsed. And here on period four, they're all trading right at the competitive equilibrium. The sellers all are earning five cents a piece, and the buyers are trading <coughs> Um, well, I thought this would be a good environment to have a look at the question of what happens if people have complete information. Now, when I went to graduate school, uh, there were two stories that were told about the conditions under which a market would might converge to competitive equilibrium. Uh, one story that was told is that everybody in the market has complete information on supply and demand. And in fact, if you study game theory, you'll find that a lot of the work in game theory and the theorems have to do with situations where everyone, who all parties who are strategically interacting have complete information on things.
things like values and costs. <clears throat> so that's, that's one story. Another story is that, well, they don't have to have complete information on everything, providing that they're price takers. In other words, if you have price taking behavior in the market, then that'll be your competitive. Well, <clears throat> if everybody's a price taker, who makes the price? You see, that that's, that's a pretty incomplete kind of theory, and I've just shown you a, an institution here in which all the participants in the market are as much a price, as much price makers as they are price takers. You're making price if you're a buyer and you, and you enter a bid. You're helping to make price if you're a seller and you enter an ask, an offer. You're taking a, a price when you accept an ask or accept a bid, okay? But it's completely free form here. With, with people free to change bids and, and ask and accept or not accept. Uh, so let me show you now an experiment in which the design is exactly the same. Okay, as, as you saw above here. The only difference is, and this was an or done, and this auction was done orally at Purdue back many years ago. Uh, the only difference is after I gave the instructions on how you make money and also what the rules of the trading are, I announced that in this particular experiment today, I said there are 11 buyers and they all have the values that I've given to these 11 buyers are all the same and it's $4.20. The little cards I passed out to the sellers, there are 16 of them. What's written on those little cards is $3.10, so they all have the same cost. So, okay, here's the market. It starts out pretty much like this one up here. Uh, it tends to collapse, but comes back up. And here in four periods of trading, it doesn't converge nearly as well as these two up here. So, uh, Complete information not only isn't necessary, it's not even sufficient to give you competitive equilibrium. In this particular uh, example, uh, and what happens here is that, of course, sellers are outraged that this price keeps tending to fall, and they hang together very, very well and try to keep those keep the prices up. The, the problem is there's 16 sellers and only 11 buyers. And those who do the best job of keeping the price up are the ones least likely to trade. Because the other sellers will kind of free ride on those who are trying to keep the price up. So it does tend to collapse, but still it's, it, it uh, stays up there pretty well and doesn't converge as well as this one. I also tried in those early years, I thought I'd see if I could save money. Instead of paying everybody, I just paid three people at random out of the uh, 27 subjects each period. And to see if that would provide good incentives. Well, you notice here, this is complete information like these up here, but it doesn't convert really, really well. So I learned very early that uh, the, the, the monitoring incentives were important. And uh, so basically, we pay everybody in our experience now. <laughs> All right, now you might wonder, well, these are uh, kind of isolated markets, just one market. What happens if, if people are trading in more than one market simultaneously? Well, that's been checked out. People have done experiments where subjects are trading in as many as 19 markets. Uh, Simultaneously. I'm going to show you the slide for one where there's just two markets. And now the demand that we induce on the uh, buyers, uh, the demand for each of two commodities depends upon the price of each. So now the demand is not nearly so well defined as it was in that previous slide. Because now the maximum amount you're willing to pay for commodity A 
depends not only on the price of A, but also the price of B. Uh, and in this particular case, we had just separable uh, supply schedules for the sellers. And this is double auction. And <coughs> people are now trading uh, simultaneously uh, with the computer, each of these two commodities. And it starts out with the usual kind of noise at the beginning. And, and it seems to take a little longer to settle into the competitive equilibrium than the, than the isolated single markets, but still tends to converge by about, it's pretty well there by the seventh or eighth period, I guess. So there's a, a multi-market example. Uh, here's uh, Four traders can do it. It's a little bit rocky in there, but they can. Uh, when, when in the fourth grade class with a roll of nickels and passed out some yellow cards to the buyer and little white cards to the sellers, and I explained the rules of this thing and market, and they just were so excited, and and we get we get such eagerness to trade that we don't get, not only was able to do it one period, but that, that the <coughs> variance was, was very uh, high. And it was pretty clear that with uh, fourth graders, uh, they would trade for nothing if they just get a chance to trade. <laughs> so some of them but just went ahead and traded at their value or their cost to be sure that they got a chance to. To uh, participate. Okay, let me now move to uh, have a look at some uh, charts in which we uh, look at the effect of price control. These experiments were done by my colleague, Mark Ozzie, and Charlie Plot a good many years ago. Here's the, the uh, value cost uh, environment, the supply and demand that they use. Uh, and in this market, uh, Mark and Charlie put a ceiling price here at 50 cents. Fed of equilibrium was up here at 60, nobody knew that, but everybody knew that there was a ceiling price of 50 cents. Now, economic theory, which is a static sort of a theory, predicts that this market will just come on to that uh, ceiling price uh, immediately because it's, it's, the ceiling is binding. Uh, it restricts trade. There will be an excess demand at that price. That will cause it to lock onto that to that uh, uh, ceiling uh, very quickly and just hang there. Well, people have to, in double option trading, have to work out a way of, of reaching that. And, what, and here's what happens in double option trading. Uh, the first whole series of contracts here tend to be below the ceiling price, and then they repeated it, part uh, period two, period three, four. It's getting there finally, period six. It walks on to that ceiling price and then hangs in there. And then they remove the ceiling, okay? And the trading just goes completely wild. Now, uh, what's going on here is that there's a lot of rationing has to occur. And when you take the ceiling off, there's this expectation that, that this unsatisfied demand is going to raise prices, but nobody knows sort of how high they're, how, how, how much the prices are going up. And in fact, it's bid up way far above the competitive board again, and only tends to come down and approach it uh, forward. Now, if you look, to get an understanding of what's going on in that experiment, and 
we did this. The data I'm going to show you is not from that experiment, but it's, it's from some others that we did at, uh, at Arizona. Get an understanding of the dynamics of what's going on in there. Let's look at first at the distribution of bids, offers, and contracts in a market without price control. Okay, here's one without price control. Now let's let's see what that what happens in those markets. You'll notice that the distribution of bids here, that's the solid line, uh, is below the distribution of offers, which is the dotted line. We're just taking all the offers from, from several periods and aggregating them, okay? It's later periods in the experiment, six and seven after it's kind of reached pretty much an equilibrium. Um, there's an overlap here of the bids and offers. And, then, and the contracts tend to entirely be in that range of overlap. Now, in a market without any price ceiling for floors, it means that buyers can, can start as low as they want to, sellers can start as high as they want to. But if you put a price ceiling in there, say below the competitive equilibrium, that truncates it offers of the sellers far more than it does the buyers. It means no seller can offer to sell above that. No buyer can either, but he's not interested in, sell, in buying above it anyway. He's gonna, he has a motivation to bid in and buy low. Uh, <clears throat> so let's look at those distributions when we have a price ceiling. Here's the ceiling price here. And notice now how, what it does to the distribution of offers. It, it, they look like, instead of looking like uh, nice symmetric mountains, they look like Matterhorns, okay? And what people have to, what sellers have to learn in a market with that ceiling price below the competitive equilibrium is to not start at the ceiling and concede, but start at the ceiling and hang tough, okay? But they can only learn that from their experience in the market since they uh, the, uh, we don't tell them anything about where the price ceiling is relative to competitive equilibrium because they don't know any of that information. They have to discover that on their, on their, on their own. Uh, and it turns out, if I can find the right slide here, price ceiling was binding. Suppose the price ceiling is not binding. Suppose it's above the competitive equilibrium. All right, the chart that I, or the distribution of bids and offers and contracts that I showed you would, if, if, you, if you looked at that, you might have reason to believe that a price ceiling that's above the competitive equilibrium, which is not supposed to be, have any effect on the market, might actually have a market because it still is truncating the offers that the sellers can, can uh, make. So here's, here's the situation, same supply and demand and, and the price ceiling is up here at uh, uh, 65 cents above the competitive equilibrium. Okay, it starts out below, below, staying below, staying below, staying below, never quite get, gets to the because that ceiling is truncating the negotiation strategies of the offers. Take away the ceiling and it hops right into competitive equilibrium. So that the lesson here is that policies like price ceilings or floors may not only affect what happens in a, in a stationary state, but might affect very well affect the whole dynamics of how a market functions. 
And therefore, Christ's ceilings, even if they're non-binding, may nevertheless be uh, not benign in terms of how, what effect they have on the market. Okay, and the time I have left, let me uh, let's just look at a couple of other questions quite different than, than the ones that I've talked about so far. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some uh, contracting practices that are sometimes used by businesses. It first arose, so far as I know, in what's called the Ethel case. This is the uh, uh, Tetra-Ethel-led case that was uh, brought by the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, you'll notice that in the experiments that I showed you so far, all these double oxygen experiments, you notice that the market start, starts out and in the price discovery, the price search and discovery process, uh, we see a lot of price discrimination. There's a lot of trades taking place at different prices. People, buyers are paying different prices for the same commodity. Sellers are selling at different prices. Uh, and so there is a fair amount of price discrimination that goes on in that uh, double auction market until it reaches competitive equilibrium, and then there's very little, of course, because most of the contracts tend to, tend to take place at the same price. Well, the issue in the, this comes up in the Ethel case. Uh, here's the contracting practice, which was uh, brought in an FTC uh, and edited. Uh, imagine that I'm the seller and you're the buyer. Well, I come and I'm gonna offer you a really sweet deal. Uh, first, I'm not going, there's not going to be any price surprises. If I decide in this, if, under our contractual relationship, if at some point I decide that I want to raise the price, I'm going to give you 30 days notice of any change in price under that contract. I'm also going to promise you in this contract that I will sell to no other buyer at a price less the contract price is not making with you. Okay. Notice that I am promising in writing that there will be no price discrimination. Uh, also, if any other seller comes to you and offers to sell to you at a lower price, I'm going to match that, match that price. Now, what could be better than that deal? I mean, you know, you're really, you're what? The seller is really taking care of you well. But think about it. What's my incentive to lower the price if I have to lower it to everybody at the same time? That reduces my incentive to lower the price, but it's very costly to me. I can't lower it to you alone. I have to do it. I promised, and I have contracts with a whole bunch of buyers saying that I will lower it to everyone if I lower it to anyone. Also, what other seller is well motivated to come to you and offer to sell at a lower price when you're gonna when I'm gonna match it? So we got a contractual arrangement here that suggests that we're gonna have a gridlock. A contractual arrangement that prevents uh, competition. That was the issue. Um, and this is contractual arrangement. Gee, how can antitrust object to this? Because it's a contractual guarantee of no price discrimination. Well, see what the one hand of government has decided to make price discrimination illegal, now the other hand of government is questioning whether this is a good practice. I don't know where these contracting practices come from. It's entirely possible that the reason why they were invented was to satisfy uh, strictures against uh, price discrimination. That, that's a good question for someone that does law and economics and looks into the history of it. So here's, here's some experimental results. Here's the demand. And the 
supply, here's the competitive equilibrium. You can also identify a joint global maximum like a monopolist would get, and also here's a Carnot equilibrium. All right, this experiment, this was a telephone market. Uh, buyers were in different rooms, sellers were in different rooms, and they would call each other up and negotiate over the telephone. Uh, and these are the mean contract prices in the order in which they occurred. Okay. No limits. If you just negotiate any contract you want to. If these, none of these ethical case contracting practices have been introduced yet. So this we're just getting a baseline. Okay. So here it is converging down competitive equilibrium. It's sort of slow, but it's uh, not as a efficient institution as the open crop outcry double option. And then we introduce the various contracting provisions, restrictions on the contracts that I just articulated to you. 30 days notice, sellable match in any price is lower from another seller. Seller will not lower the price to any buyer without lowering it to everyone. And these were all enforced by the experimenter. And now the prices hop right up there. And then, at this point, we get away with that and let free contracting occur, and the prices come back down. Now, the lesson in this is that price discrimination, the fact that different prices are being charged to different people, isn't necessarily a bad thing if it's part of the price search equilibrating process. And, in fact, if you go in there and make rules to say you're not going to allow it, it's entirely possible that you'll do more harm than good. And here's an, an example of a contracting arrangement that assures that there is not going to be any, any uh, price discrimination, and in fact, it's, it's, it has an anti-competitive uh, effect. All right, one last uh, little exercise. This is an exercise in economic design. One of the things that we do is ask whether we can invent new ways of trading, and then ask whether these new ways of trading, what their properties are, uh, whether they are good at producing competitive equilibrium, or are they good at maximizing gains from exchange. <coughs> Pair them with ordinary continuous double auction or other institutions. And this uh, experiment we call, or this particular institution we call, we call it up a uniform price double auction. And what happens in the uniform price double auction is as the, as the bids arrive in real time from buyers, and as the offers arrive in real time, Sellers. The computer continually updates and resorts the bids from highest to lowest and lowest to highest and advertises to everyone in the market what the tentative market clearing price is at that point in time. But nothing becomes binding yet. Nothing is binding when contracts are not formed until the time runs out. Okay, now the market may be four minutes long, say, or five minutes. So it's like the continuous double auction in the sense that the, the bids and offers are coming in in real time, but they're not allowed to produce binding contracts as you go. And when, this, when the time runs out, then all of these bids and offers are cleared out at one market clearing price. Okay. So, so the idea is to try to get a market which doesn't price discrimination produces just one rise, but still gives you uh, a lot of the same information and hopefully the same the similar equilibrating conditions that you get in double auction, ordinary continuous double auction trade. Uh, here's the particular supply and demand schedules we use. And in this case, we made it a pretty tough environment. We constantly shop and move the, buy, the demand and supply around. We added a random, or some, subtracted a random constant from, from all of the values and costs each period. And
and then resorting them, reallocating them among the different uh, buyers and sellers. And there were five buyers and five sellers. And in fact, the sequence of competitive equilibrium prices, that's the midpoint of a whole, that's actually a whole bunch of competitive equilibrium. Uh, the actual sequence is shown there. And of course, none of the subjects knew uh, how the, uh, the their values and costs were being uh, shocked each period. Um, so here's a comparison of the results on the right here of the UPTA market institution over here. Here's the same uh, environment in continuous double option. What you see here, all these X's are different contracts. A whole bunch of different contracts that are taking place at different prices in the continuous double option. And what I've plotted here is the mean of those contracts. Okay. The bars here, that's the competitive equilibrium. Well, notice that continuous double option, as we kind of already knew, tracks changes in supply and demand well. But there's a fair amount of volatility in the prices each period as people discover where, try to find out where the, the uh, where prices must settle in the market. Uh, over here on this side is the uniform price double option. So now we have just one price that clears the market each period. And the, and the open question in this research was whether it would track as well as the continuous double option. Turns out it does. It tracks very well. This market, though, has less volatility than this one. The, so you can think of every market as having the volatility in prices as coming from two sources. One is the exogenous source of shocks that are coming from outside the market that are shifting the supply and demand schedules are all around. And then the volatility within the market, which is part of the process of discovering a, uh, that, the, that the participants go through in order to discover uh, price. And what the uniform price, this is sometimes called the call market uh, in finance. The, in this case, bids and offers are coming in real time, and then we, when we call the market at the end of the, the collection period, and everything is cleared at one price. Uh, in this call market, <clears throat> we have zero variability within the period, so that almost all of the volatility in the market is coming from, from outside. So this institution pretty much does away with most of the volatility that you get in continuous uh, double option trading. I think that's enough to explain. You've been a good audience. Uh, I've used your time here for nearly a full hour, so uh, should we take questions? Who's in charge here? Sure. Anyone? Anyone?
diameter, which is just as well. In fact, one use of experiment is to, I gave you that last slide as an example, uh, use experiments to sort of test and convince the way to play it. And we've done a lot of work around the world in privatization of electric power. You can see in Australia now, deregulation of the United States. Uh, in Australia, we helped them design an experiment that would look at the question of how many generating elements they want to create from the privatization.
replicated these with subjects of varying levels of sophistication, and, and then there's so much reliability between the groups in terms of the Well, we've done it with uh, a training graduate student who are part of the community. They come in for a week-long workshop from other other institutions, and they become part of the community to get to know each other quite a lot. We see a lot. We certainly see differences. And, for example, we have a public goods game. <coughs> uh, where they're dividing, they each get to spend a dollar, a hundred dollars. And on each round, we have to divide that between private accounts. Okay, let's say 10 cents a token. And then a group account where the return is much higher than 0.1, but it's applied to the total amount of tokens and it's set up so that it's in your individual private interest to put your money in the private account, even though everyone puts money in the group account, they're all set up. Okay. Uh, now, this is usually used to kind of demonstrate the problem of free life on the property, basically. And one of the things we learned is that the strong free rider hypothesis does work. People do not get zero to the group. Okay. It does tend to deteriorate over time. You go through 10 iterations, it'll fall. But not to zero. When we'll start out, people are getting on average about 50% of the growth of the group account. And that will deteriorate to about 20% and then drop. If you start them over, you don't have to send them home. Just start them over and say, well, let's do it. Let's start over and do it. And more, it comes back up. And which creates a problem for a learning theory. You have to well, why is this problem? Okay, well, there are certain things that start to get a handle on that. But anyway, in uh, this community, uh, back in the the first time we had a group in, they all agreed. They didn't know what these kind of they knew it was going to be something that was public good. So they agreed that they were all in the period. And it worked very well. They didn't get 100% for their first. A later group did something even more ingenious. Each, they agreed, each wanted to log on the computer with somebody else's name. So I think what that does is it's in. The money you're going to have to be paid is, uh, 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 is that it's going to be paid from the name and it's assigned to somebody else. So now, you want to give as much as possible, but you're going to, you're going to collect over Of course, we have 100% contribution. So there's an example of what sophisticated people can do, especially when they're, they form a community. And there's a lot goes on outside the experiment, it's outside of our, completely outside of our control. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, learning curve. Um, what if you present these experiments within an economy that's in transition, such as Eastern Bloc? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to present these experiments in Eastern Bloc countries? With oh, oh. Uh, well, that's been done. <coughs> uh, the double auction, fine uh, man, those have been done in Russia, China, and uh, Now, in, there's been some cross-cultural studies of two-person bargaining games, and there are some differences there. Uh, let's see, Israeli, Turks, American, Japanese. Uh, so we can get to experiments that are more sensitive to individual characteristics, like two-person bargaining. We need the individual decision making. We start to pick up. When you were talking about an institution that is robust and double operated, it's uh, very hard to tell. 
And the nice thing about doing experiments in some of the is you can make the reward far, far larger than cost very much. It's in the uh, You do experiments with uh, farmers in India, and you pay them Thank you. 